onto my computer and I see a little eye. Do you actually, I think from your end, you can also see when we're recording. So that's nice. Yes. Yes, I can see it. Okay. Well, then we can get started. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Welcome to Lane Time Chat, our very first episode. And before we get started, we have a special shout out to our first two patrons, our original patrons. Although now I think David just mentioned we have a third. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yep. That's so exciting. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we are going to be talking today. We're going to be introducing ourselves a little bit and the goals that we have for the live stream link time studio videos um, and many of you were perhaps listening in so you got to see our first one uh, that we just did on Thursday. Uh, I've prepared the topics for today but David hasn't seen them yet which is all very exciting. Do I get to choose them by category and money? So like you know mm. you just tell me the topics and then I give you the dollar value and then you read they, the question. I'm sorry uh, you read the answer and I give you the question. They are color coded, which means we could do something like that. But then my concern is it would be horribly out of order. <laughs> so no. <laughs> mm. Okay. What so is now, no? What is no? No, you don't get to choose. <laughs> <laughs> I have answered this. And my first one is a doozy because I have waited for a month to ask you this question. Oh. But I saved it for this podcast so that our patrons could hear the answer, too. Oh, my God. I know. Are you ready? Yeah. In February, on Con Langery's Con Langing and Dungeons and Dragons episode, you and Joey Windsor were interviewed by George Corley. Mm. Do you happen to remember the first two things you said? Oh, it was, uh, it was, um, it was uh, something about the balloon, right? Yes. You said, hi, I have a balloon with me. Your second thing was it's letting out air. I need to know everything there is to know about the balloon. Okay, so everything. <laughs> so it wasn't a real balloon. The joke was like uh, the others couldn't hear it, but <laughs> when I came on and when he started, there was like kind of a weird, kind of like a high pitched whistle, but it wasn't like a feedback <laughs> thing. It sounded like air being let out of a balloon. And so I, I mean, I thought everybody could hear it. <laughs> including the listeners and I was just like you know I thought I'd make a joke about the balloon noise that clearly everybody heard and it was just and me this whole time I've been envisioning yeah. this balloon and I wondered what did it look like how did he have it why was it letting out air was it slowly dying no listen first of all yes they are because we have a balloon closet you Wait. know this right Oh, but well, you don't know this. Yeah, we have a balloon closet. Yeah. So uh, the issue is that many balloons have these strings, right, that mm -hmm. cats cannot eat. And right. so when balloons yeah. come home, when mm -hmm. they're not being played with, they need to be put away so the kitties can't get them. And so smart. our coat closet has just gradually become a balloon closet because once the balloon is in the closet, everybody forgets about it, including Meridian. They right. don't get played with. There's a gigantic inflatable squeaky dolphin in there oh it's amazing <laughs> and it's like every time we want to open that thing up and get a coat a whole bunch of balloons come cascading out we have to get the coat and shove all the balloons back in and close the door really quickly <laughs> and it is an it is an entire mess and uh, honestly there are a number of times where i might have been a little bit happier with a coat but i just said you know what I don't need a coat. Don't want to deal with the balloons. I don't think I need a coat. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, that... I looked at the time and I was, I, I just envisioned the cascade of balloons and it's like, you know what? Okay. Can we just say though that that story I think was potentially better than you actually having had a balloon in the room with you at the time, because now I know about the balloon closet. Okay, <laughs> That's amazing. That reminds me of that episode of Community, and again, you need to you need to get in there Apparently. and watch Community. Uh, yes, but yes. The the episode with Brie Larson, the first one in season four. Uh, okay. You know, Abed is being set up on a double date, and one of them is a really kooky girl who talks to him by blowing up a balloon, and then 
allowing the balloon to be released, uh, the, the air to be released. <laughs> right. And then after it's done, she says, like, I invited you to the Sadie Hawkins dance when I blew into the balloon. Did you hear it when it, uh, <laughs> the air escaped? <laughs> of course. I'm sorry, of the course. Sophie B. Hawkins dance, the Sophie B. Hawkins yes. dance. Yes, yes. No, wait, no, that was the Sadie Hawkins, because there was also going to no, be Sadie a, con a concomitant Sophie B. Hawkins dance, uh, because Britta didn't want to admit that she had mixed up Sadie Hawkins and Sophie B. Hawkins. Oh, my gosh. Okay, yeah. yes, I do need to watch this show. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Good stuff. So I feel like you just gave us one of these, but I'm going to request another because mm -hmm. besides collecting balloons in a closet, mm -hmm. what is one random fact about you that is not conlang, linguistics, or language related? The only important thing in my life is music. That's oh. it. Because music one, family two, <laughs> ice cream three. Um, <laughs> ice cream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, that's, this is, uh, honestly, it, 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 the only thing I don't like about doing this is that I can't be listening to music. I actually tried it once. I tried a, a live stream while uh, listening to music in my headphones uh -huh. and also talking. First of all, it was a little difficult to regulate the volume of my voice. And yes. second, it just wasn't as enjoyable because I couldn't sing along. You could have. That was always an option, I would like yeah. to point out. I'm not well, sure everybody would have understood why you were breaking into song. I suppose, but I am going to throw this out there, though I suppose it would have been a cover. This is important to know. Uh, we can't ever have, like when we're doing these YouTube things, we can't have like music or television shows playing in the background because if they catch it, holy smoke, they will, oh. they will take down our stream and we will get a big oh, fat warning no. And, uh, okay. and and you know, we'll get a frowny face. There is an actual frowny face that appears in your account. Yes, I yeah. have seen that. So, okay, so you literally could not sing aloud, even mm -hmm. though that I think. is- Oh, that reminds me. Okay, Art of Language Invention, the book I wrote. Okay. Yes, which just, is amazing. Okay, did you, by the way, just out of curiosity, did you like mm -hmm. actually read it or, you know, just like kind of refer to it? I actually um, read it and- Okay. I'm trying to remember if my highlighted copy is here by me, but I actually like made highlights and stuff. Wow. Okay. I, I don't know. But it's just like, well, for, for people that were like, you know, uh, veteran conlangers and also longtime linguists, I, I assume there was a lot of stuff that they would just skip over. Yeah. You know, oh, well, and I can totally see that in terms of um, reading it, but I was also reading it with the intention of, and I have used it as a textbook for my class. Ah, and so yeah, like, yeah. I need to see All every right. detail that my students see. Yes, yeah. no, that's a very good point. Okay, so there was um, one of the, um, there was one of, uh, one of the, it was in the phonetic section, I talked about central vowels, because I thought uh -huh. the only way to really get the idea of central vowels is mm -hmm. to, it's like the only place that Americans hear them was in the 1990s when male rock musicians did this thing where they had this froggy voice where they just centralized all their vowels. And so I wanted to demonstrate it with uh, Eddie Vedder because he was just a prime example mm -hmm. um, of this uh, vowel centralification. So um, when I was recording the audio book, yes. I, I read it and then I get to the part and I actually got, I said, can't find a bit of man. And then the, nice. the, uh, the producer, he, he comes in and he says, uh, uh, this guy's a really good uh, British fellow. He says, I'm sorry, David, but I'm afraid that we can't have any bit of copyrighted music on this, even if you're singing it. I I'm really sorry, but we can't have that in there. I was like, oh, brother. And so then I tried to do it just saying it, and it does not work. <laughs> no, it does not. Um, and I would like to point out that I'm supposing that since this is only on Patreon, our recording won't get taken down for you oh, having no. just done that <laughs> oh no 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 no. we're fine this is uh, this is our own audio recording it is no problem yeah 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 we're good okay. um yeah so, I, guess, I assume by the way just just, just i'm sorry just real uh -huh. quick i assume it's got to be okay because there are so many thousands of videos on youtube of people doing covers you would think so right? and yet like the one person that yeah, yeah i don't understand how some people get away with it and others are like immediately down yeah. Um, anyway, so right. I think you know this about me, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I collect garden gnomes. Oh yes, I do know that about you. <laughs> and I think, yeah, I think you've seen my gnomes. Um, mm -hmm. 
and I'm actually looking around, not that anyone can see since this is a recording, um, but I'm like, oh, look at that. There's a gnome sleeping over there. I've got a little gnome up there. Um, yes, that is a, a random factoid about me. Yeah, Gnomeo and Juliet must have been a really important time for you. I love that movie. <laughs> It's like, finally, it was for me, like when Moonbeam City came out. I mean, I felt like finally something that was made just for me. Um, I, and I, I, I bet you, you don't even know Moonbeam City. I don't. And I, I feel embarrassed that you no, know no. my all-consuming movie. <laughs> well, well, Nomeo and Juliet, I mean, got a, more, a lot more press, obviously. I mean, it was a movie. Right. It was a big deal. It was a kid's right. movie. Everybody heard about it. But Moonbeam City was uh, uh, an animated show that ran for one season on Comedy Central. I loved it. Um, the entire, uh, it was kind of like, uh, it, it, it basically, the, the show Archer, the animated okay. show Archer, it really kind of like, I think, gave them the green light was when they were describing it. But the art style was Nagel. You know Nagel? No, I only know Nagel because sometimes that's an answer in my crossword puzzle. <laughs> okay. Really no. Okay, so you're you're gonna know this because again, we were born at the same time. You better know this. Do you okay. remember Charlotte Roos? Yeah. Okay. Now, when you were going to malls and stuff in the eighties, maybe even into the early nineties, and then it kind of went away in the nineties. Do you remember the pictures of women, the very stylized pictures of women that they would yeah. have on the Charlotte yeah. Bruce bags? That was Nagel. He was an artist nice. and he did women like that. That was, that was okay. his thing. Yeah. Hey, as a side note, um, mm -hmm. Missouri is behind California. So Charlotte Bruce was a thing all the way into the 2000s and beyond. <laughs> One of my friends was a manager and they only recently closed in St. Louis, I want to say like five years ago. I mean, they may still be around. They may have tried to rebrand, re but I mean, Charlotte Russe in the 1980s was so perfect, so <laughs> perfect. It was like, it took everything and said, this is your decade, here it is. It was amazing. Uh, I loved going there, even though it was a women's clothing store and I was a young child, I just liked looking. It was so cool. Another fun fact, mm -hmm. I did not go to malls very often in the 80s because it was an hour away for us. Oh, of course, right, yeah. Country living. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so was, I did not experience the 80s Charlotte Russe. Whereas we had to decide which of the two nearby malls we were gonna go to when we were gonna hang out <laughs> based on what arcades they had there. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I also didn't go to arcades. Oh, or, so many things. Or movies, like you saw movies, right? Have you heard of those? They're talking pictures. I, I think I saw a few of those before. I saw like some advertising. <laughs> Yeah, but we did have to drive 40 minutes to get to a theater. Um, <laughs> moving wow, <on>. really? <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> when I say I was like... raised in the country, I mean the country. <laughs> wow. And I assume that it was 40 minutes, even though it was five minutes away, because you had to go shovel the snow and then drive forward five feet and then get out and shovel the snow. <laughs> I love how that's mission. <laughs> that's only one season out of four. Um, and no, it was 40 minutes on highways driving 60. <laughs> Dang. So a little different, a little different. Wow. Um, cool. So moving on to linguistics. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I'm curious to know when and how you discovered linguistics as an academic field. Because I feel like a lot of people don't know what linguistics is until like college. And so mm -hmm. I'm curious to know when you were introduced to it. College. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So same. Uh, here. <laughs> had, had no idea. Had no idea. So I, um, I became very, very interested in learning languages when I was 17. Um, I, I woke up uh, very sharply from a dream one morning, which is something I don't usually do. Mornings are tough for me. But I woke up and I was like, there are millions of people in the world that speak French and I am not one of them. And I was so like both embarrassed and furious at this fact. I was like, this is not right. I have to be one of those people. And so I, I made a vow to learn French. And then I made a second immediate double vow, which was to learn every single language on the planet. Every, everyone. Yeah. So all like, all like 150, which is what I assumed. I was just going to ask at 17, what was the number? <laughs> yeah. I was, 
I was like, okay, there's about, there's about 200 countries, but lots of countries speak the mm -hmm. same language. So, yeah, probably about 150. That's Sure, sure. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> totally. So yeah. I also tried to teach myself languages at a much younger age, um, but it, it failed miserably because mm -hmm. um, I was 10. <laughs> which, which languages? Um, well, it was just Spanish at the time. Um, and my dad actually was a high school teacher and brought home a, a Spanish book from the high school teacher, knowing that I was like so curious about the language and wanting to learn it. And, oh gosh. Oh, I, I hate to tell you that my experiment failed and that I then moved okay. on to German and that's the language I speak better. Mm. <laughs> I understood. Doch, you Deutsch sprechen. <laughs> yeah, wir können das. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, it failed miserably because in my head I thought that all you had to do was take out like an English word and replace it with a Spanish one. Mm -hmm. Turns out that's not true. Uh, <laughs> and also, I didn't know that the pronunciation was different. So, oh, you know, like for, for instance, orange in my head was anaranja. And like, <laughs> you know, so like just thinking, how would an English person say it? Um, I didn't have access to actual people who spoke Spanish. So it was just literally me in a textbook trying to learn and it failed. So I, I have a similar story in that when I started learning French, because um, a friend of mine uh, had just had a textbook. A lot of, so uh, the, the city I live in, there is a, a huge Vietnamese community. And there are a lot of Vietnamese who learn French for cultural reasons, even if it's okay. outside of school. So she just had an extra French textbook and gave it to me. And so I started learning it. Um, you know, of course, I came from a home where Spanish was spoken, so I had that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I looked at French like, oh, this is very similar. Um, and I had a girlfriend at the time who spoke French. Um, and so I was like, I've been teaching myself French. I'm like, really? I'm like, yeah, I was wondering if you could tell me how I'm doing. And so I start reading it. And it's like, I knew that the French J was a je. And I okay. knew that a lot of the vowels weren't pronounced. But I didn't really know anything else. So it, I was like, you know, nice. so it was like, I was like, uh, uh, J'ai ma paye Renoir. And I was like, she oh, started laughing. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, why are you laughing? I mean, there there couldn't be any other way that these things are pronounced, right? <laughs> that mm. is amazing. Okay, yeah. so you, you, like me, discovered linguistics in college. So yes. what was your favorite linguistics course that you took? Oh boy, that's a tough one because I like them all. Right. First by, first, by the way, to connect the dots here, I started taking a bunch of languages as a freshman, and then my mother suggested that I would like linguistics, and I hadn't heard of it, and so awesome. I asked her what it was, and she said, "Well, it's the it's kind of the scientific study of languages," and I said, "That seems pointless. You don't even learn the languages. <laughs> like, why?" Anyway, but I took it. And then anyway. you discovered why. <laughs> I took it anyway on the very first day. I was like, "Wow." this is amazing. I think I should probably add this as my second major because it was so much fun and it was so easy, which, you know, I guess it's part of the goal of that first class, right? Right. They, they want to hook you. And yet there are still people that find it quite challenging. Which I think it's easy for people away. with certain minds because teaching students yeah. who don't find it easy, sometimes I'm like, but all you have to do is like apply this. And I, I think that is hard sometimes to see that it's, you know, easy for people who love it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So for favorite classes, do we want to stick to undergraduate or graduate too? I will give you one for each. Oh my God. One undergraduate one. class. Yeah. I guess. <sighs> oh, wow. This is obviously not able to come through mm. on, on a recording, but I want you guys to know he looks like he's in physical pain. Hands mm. over face. I mean, it's the mm. whole deal. I've narrowed it down to two, but it's really hard to choose between the two. Um, both were so important for me. Um, okay, I'll, I'll let you say both of them. Okay, so I'll John. Let you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, John McWhorter's Pigeons and Creoles class uh, was foundational, and I absolutely loved it. Um, that was a really, really good class. And that was the first time I ever did a project on a created language. That was where I created oh. my, uh, I, I came up with the idea of, uh, of this, uh, of a super Creole 
In other words, I just came up with a word list with no grammar, but I handpicked the word list. Um, mm -hmm. So there would be things that, you know, users could uh, profitably turn into other parts of speech and grammatical elements and also compound and things like that. Right. So I did that. Um, and then the other class was um, the introduction to cognitive science. So it was, yeah, it's, it's cheating. It was a cross-listed course. It was a cognitive science course that also had a linguistics thing, but that one, that's where I learned about, uh, you know, George Lakoff's uh, theory of metaphor and it just really just blew my mind. Oh, that anyway. is mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those were those two, those were two undergraduate courses for graduate. It was Farrell Ackerman's morphology class. Um, which was uh, the my introduction to lexicalist, lexicalist morphology, um, and completely, completely, radically changed the way I look at language forever after that, and also radically changed the way that I conlang. Um, it was so good that I took the course again, not because oh, wow. I felt like I needed to, um, but just because I wanted to hear it again to make sure sometimes things take a while with me to percolate mm -hmm. um but that was really really phenomenal the harry bachner has this very influential thesis and analysis of latin um and all this stuff is by the way just uh non-morphemic analysis non-morphemic morphological analysis and his analysis of latin completely just ripped apart everything i knew about language and replaced it with something better it was extraordinary Okay, so we're going to need to list that book uh, somewhere. I'll have to get that title, specific title, author, everything mm -hmm. from you, because yeah. I, I need my world to be ripped apart and placed back together. <laughs> 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 um, so what's funny is whenever I wrote that question and I was thinking, same as you, like I loved them all. Uh, I mean, that's why I chose it. Same as you too, I took a linguistics class not knowing what it was, and um, in fact, before the first day of class, I started flipping through the textbook and loved it so much that I read three chapters in before the first day of class. And I'm like, when does that ever happen? <laughs> <laughs> College nice. Yeah. Um, but I was so excited by it. And yeah, within the first three weeks of class, I switched my major to linguistics. Um, and so I think that intro course, because it was my first one, is probably what I would call my quote favorite. Yeah, um, I had to. Just because it was my to... introduction. You, I mean, that's the thing you said for one class, I had to take that one off my list, but man, what a fun experience. Like yes. it, it wasn't like, you know, like the, what the sum total of what you learned after that intro class was going to match anything you learned later. Right. But just that first experience of going to class and every single day was a joy and you were learning something yes. new and exotic and mind blowing. Ah, It was good. It was amazing. And speaking of, university and academics mm. um we have a six degrees of kevin bacon kind of thing Ooh. academically right um because you did your undergrad at berkeley mm. my phd advisor dr laura michaelis did her graduate work at berkeley by the way so, i just said hi to her fyi oh yay um lovely person and wonderful advisor and yeah so there's the berkeley connection mm -hmm. um and you did your graduate work at University of California at San Diego. Mm. My undergraduate linguistic advisor, Dr. Gregory Richter, did his PhD there. Whoa. And so both your schools produced the people who became my advisors nice. at both levels. And I actually considered going to UCSD for grad school. And if I had, we would have been there at the same time. Oh my God. Are you serious? I am so serious because I, oh. because I knew that was where Dr. Richter went and I adored him and I still do um, at Truman State University. And so because I knew he went there, I was like, oh, I should really, you know, look into going there too. Um, and one of the only reasons that I didn't end up applying was because I looked at cost of living and things like that. And I was like, I, I don't know how I would survive. <laughs> well, uh, I, let me let me say that it was a mistake for that reason, and I'll explain why in a minute. But you probably made the right choice for a different reason. Oh, and by the way, I have met Dr. Richter. Oh my gosh, I yeah. love him. 
because you know when I went and gave a talk at Truman State because Doug Ball, my good friend, yes. also a conlanger, also teaches a conlang classes there at Truman State. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so um, would we have been there at exactly the same time? So, like you entered graduate school in the fall of two thousand three. Yes, except I entered at University of Colorado at Boulder. Yeah, unbelievable. Yes. Did you? You didn't even come to the admit weekend, did you? Like you didn't, you didn't apply at all. No, no. I actually only applied to Colorado. I did that thing that you're not supposed to do. If you had applied to UCSD, you know, they were going to, they invited everybody that they accepted to come oh. for like a few days. You would have been there at the same time as me yes. and Aaron and Doug yes. Ball. Oh my gosh. It would have been, that would have been a party right there. Because <laughs> Doug Ball, of course, was deciding between UCSD and Stanford. Okay. Um, and I, I saw him and I recognized his name from the conling list. I actually came up to him. I said, because, you know, we were standing in, in line to get lunch. And so I, because I'd never met Doug. And I said, right. hey, um, are you part of any list serves? And like, you met, you've met Doug, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like in this Doug way, he turns and he says, no. And I say, uh, okay, uh, let, me, let me try this again. Are you part of the conling list serve? He says, oh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. And I was like, hey, we know each other. I'm David. <laughs> Doug. I mean, I'm, I'm Kamakawi, you're Scara. And so uh, anyway, so Doug was making this decision between UCSD and Stanford. He ultimately decided on Stanford. Um, mm -hmm. They were going to give him, they were going to give him more money. Um, he ended up finishing his PhD there, uh, but had no teaching experience by the end of it. And so he had a tough time getting a job. He finally made it to Truman State and they love him there, so that's great. But then, so here's the thing, yeah, if you had come, if you had been there, we uh -huh. would, okay? We would have and, all been there. And you understand that at the time, Eric Bakovich was trying to uh, get me to create a conlanging class. Yes, yes. Yeah, and finally so did I did get off the ground after I left, but you know. Right, um, But right. So, he, so here's the thing. Um, I have no idea if this would have been affected by being out of state, but um, like when we got to graduate school, okay, um, all tuition and fees were covered, of course, okay. because we were TAs. Mm -hmm. And they paid us money for being TAs. Right. And then when you got into graduate housing, it was like $600 a month. <laughs> so we left graduate school with more money than we came in with. I wish I could say the same, but, and here's the thing, like, I, I got a deal at CU too, and that's not the thing. Um, it just turns out that if you want to leave grad school with more money than you went in with, don't have a baby. <laughs> yeah, there is always that. Anyway, though, but uh, I, but I, is expensive. <laughs> so I, I was going to say, but aside, of course, aside, of course, from Will, but uh, it's, yeah. it's a good thing that you went to Boulder because um, I have to say that most of the people that entered uh, UCSD at the time that we did, did not, they left academia after oh. a year or two. It Interesting. Was kind of, it was kind of um, a not great time to be there. The department okay. was in flux. There were a lot of issues okay. that have since gone on to be resolved. And UCSD is just a phenomenal place right now to be as a graduate student. Um, but um, but yeah, at the time, like there were a lot of people that went in and left, just mm -hmm. not knowing what to do. There is right. there is a chance that you might not have gotten a PhD had you got there. So. Ah, well, I'm glad I went to Colorado because that yep. was what I was going for. Definitely. Uh, so, do you actually remember the first time you encountered a conlang? Uh, yeah, actually, the, the very first time I was still in high school um, uh, and it was uh, we would go to library book sales a lot, uh, my mother and I, um, because, you know, they sell books for 25 cents. So it's like, right. I mean, oh, I would just all go and get all these books. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, of course, you know, my other thing was, you know, I, I, I was I eventually became an English major. But basically, the only thing I was interested in was literature um, at that time. So. Um, Anyway, uh, I can't remember if it was me or my mother that found this book, but um, I was already interested in languages and learning languages mm -hmm. at this time, so I was looking stuff up. 
and it was either me or my mother found this book called uh, Step by Step in Esperanto. And, um, and I said, what the heck is this? And my mother said, oh, I heard about this. This is a language that somebody made to be in uh, like uh, an international, like simple language. And I was like, somebody made it? What the hell does that mean? <laughs> right. And, and so I got this book, Step by Step in Esperanto, which I think was published in 1925. I still have it. Um, in fact, I'm looking at it. There it is right there. It's on my oh, shelf. Nice. Yeah. Um, and I started to go through it and I found it, you know, interesting. But, um, but I was like, I, I don't know. I was like, this is, this is cool and fun, but um, I don't think you could really use this because like I've never heard of it before then. Anyway, so I, I just had that and it was in the back of my mind. And then the second semester at, at, uh, at Berkeley, you know, I'm coming into the dorm one day and there's an advertisement taped to the front door of the big dorm building and it says, um, a decal class, a student talk class on Esperanto. And I'm like, no way. All right, I'm definitely taking this. <laughs> that is so cool. And by the I way, actually, uh -huh. oh, just real quick, the professor, or, or sorry, they, they were both the same year as I, as I was, so they okay. were just second semester freshmen, but it was team taught by two people who were native Esperanto speakers, and one of them later went on to be interviewed for the Conlanging, the Art of Crafting Tongues documentary. Oh, nice. So that I got is so say, exciting. Got to say hi to her again. Yeah, she's still awesome. in the air in this area, actually. Pretty cool. Awesome. Okay. Um, so. And Esperanto was also my first interaction with a conlang. Um, and it was actually in middle school because one of my teachers for a program I was in had given, it, it was essentially like a logic analytical thinking kind of exercise, but it was a paragraph in Esperanto with like, basically a, a small subset of rules and you had to figure out how to translate the passage. And so it was like this whole, just huh. a translation activity. Yeah. But I was so blown away and in awe of, and I, I didn't like you, I didn't understand what did it mean that somebody created it. Um, yeah. But it was like one of the funnest things. And so I didn't encounter Esperanto again until much later in life. Um, but that was my very first and I love that interaction. Um, so what was your first conling? I know we've talked about your first conlings before, but right. I thought it might be fun to tell patrons where you started and not only what was your first conling, but what lesson did you learn from creating it? Yeah. So my, my very first conling was called Meg Davy, a very embarrassing name for the language because it was based on my girlfriend's name at the time and mine. Her name was <laughs> Megan. Obviously. Name was David. So we had Meg <laughs> It still Davey. is. Yeah, yeah, it remains so to this day. I've never <laughs> lived it down. I should have changed my name after that language. But exactly, um, I I was taking Arabic at the time, and uh, I loved Arabic. I found it fascinating. I found its triconsonantal root system absolutely fascinating. I'd never seen a language that worked like that, and so I uh, I wanted to create a language that had a system just like that, uh, and so I did. Um, and it was like, it was basically the type of thing where it's just there were patterns for all different types of nouns, basically noun classes, and then um, patterns for different verb conjugations and things like that, and then triconsonal roots. And I had a whole bunch, and I had a number system so that you could make any root into a number. Um, and then it was like they had a ones a digit, tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, like millions, billions trillions and quadrillions it went up that far and then nice. yeah and then it was also the opposite of that so one over that oh goodness <laughs> yeah it had all of that um and um you know it, it was uh, it was very regular because i wanted it to be easy to use uh, for some reason while also at the same time creating this grammar that was completely arcane um and um and you know it was it was fine. I was creating it. I was very excited about it. Uh, and I went along with it. But then um, I, at some point in time, I started translating Shakespeare's The Tempest, uh, the play into it. Um, and so I was just going along, you know, uh, act one, scene one, just start. And I was like, okay, this is that word. This is that word. I don't have that word. So let's just create a root for it. And there's that word and so on and so forth. And I was going along like that. And then I came across a word that I pronounced boatswain. Love it. 
yeah, mm -hmm. which I didn't know how that was actually pronounced. I thought it was <laughs> Boatswain because it was written Boatswain. It looks like it. Bosun, like seriously, Bosun. <laughs> You're going to tell me it looks like Boatswain and it says, and you say Bosun? That's just <laughs> absolutely terrible. So back, um, back to the co-committant. <laughs> uh, so I was like, I, I, I remember, I think I actually message the conling list and you can check this too because we have the archives up they're free for anybody to look at so just like search for boatswain <laughs> written like that <laughs> um i think i asked people like what the heck it was and then i was like when i figured out what it was like, oh, okay so i'll create a new route for that and then like um that was where i started to think you know what this is weird because like why should it have its own route because uh not knowing how it was pronounced right I could mm -hmm. look and see that this boat swain in air quotes was clearly a compound, right? A boat clearly. and something else, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and I was like, why is this thing its own root in my language? Because that's like treating it as if it's as basic as the word like son or kid or mom or something like that, right? right? And I was like, that's weird. And so I started to look at my vocabulary and notice other irregularities. For example, having different roots for uh ship and boat yep that's interesting right? yeah <laughs> that's and, then a choice. <laughs> and then i also noticed that okay we have a, a word that means uh uh to fortify uh, the verb and mm -hmm. then its nominalized form is fortification which also means a fort like and that was when i, I realized i am just recoding english semantics 100 percent uh-huh and that was it. The language was done. Like I couldn't use it anymore. It was it was way too big to be fixed. Right. And it was just garbage. And so I stopped uh, with that. I created a new language. I believe the second language was Kamakawi. It was either that or Gwater. No, it was Gwater. That was it. And then I just started creating new language after new language, and they would slowly get better and better and better until um, I got to this one we're creating. And nice. now it's even better because <laughs> it has your input. <laughs> <laughs> Times two. Yeah, so my first conlang, I'm kind of cheating a little bit because it wasn't actually a conlang. But at the time, I didn't know it because, again, I was young. I was in fifth grade. And um, I essentially just created a, a very, very fancy code for English by mixing up letters. But I knew that they had to be pronounceable still. Like I understood that much about language that you couldn't just mix up the letters any which way you wanted in words. But mm -hmm. things like, OK, so like the word what has W-H-A-T. So, you know, maybe my new word was WATH, W-A-T-H. So, you know, Ooh. like I was doing this kind of thing, but then just replacing all English words. So it was horribly English-based, just a code for English. But I learned a very important social lesson from it, and that's that no one else will learn your language to speak with you. <laughs> I learned the same thing. <laughs> and I didn't understand. I even created lesson plans that I kept in a trapper keeper. Like, here, I have it all for you. I've got vocab lists, and they wanted none of it. Mm -hmm. None of it. Yeah. So, I, so then when I found out that Esperanto was a thing after that, I was like, see, it works. <laughs> and I was just mind blown that it worked for somebody. Um, I did the oh, same thing, by the way. I presented okay. this language to my girlfriend as a gift, which oh, I, I love it. Which I always say it was kind of like um, Homer giving Marge a bowling ball. It says Homer on it. <laughs> um, it was terrible. So yeah, yeah, you learn that. Like, yeah, yeah, no, just because you think it's really cool and you're really enthusiastic, it doesn't mean that anybody's going to do it. That is so true. So true. Mm -hmm. All right. So moving into the final card. Yep. And it is just appropriately labeled Lang Time Studio. And actually mm -hmm. today in our um, video, you mentioned why you had started it. And, and this was the, the idea was your idea that you wanted to live stream these videos. Um, but I am curious to know uh, what personal goal or things you're excited about um, that will be an outcome besides the languages, obviously, but like what, what goals or outcomes that you might be excited about for the venture? I only care about the languages. That's it. <laughs> That's, That's it. it. That's no. It. <laughs> 
honestly, though, as, as as corny as it sounds, I just enjoyed working with you and I wanted to keep doing it. And this seemed oh, like the best so way sweet. to do it. <laughs> um, and, but but well, also- One of my goals is very selfish, yeah. by the way, because I was mm -hmm. like, oh, we get to do this historical thing and break it down step by step so I can get better at it. Mm. Well, of course, we're, we're always <laughs> both getting better at it constantly as long as you remember the stuff that actually made you better that's the tough thing you got to remember yes. but but also though no I, I i do have i've always had this idea i come from a teaching family and so i always think if i'm doing anything you know it's helpful to to lay it out so that others can follow along and you know or at least be entertained so either be educated or at least be entertained that's it but <laughs> But yeah, like, uh, that's why, uh, I, I mean, because, you know, it's, it's especially, it's easier to do it if you're just, you know, filming it while you're doing it, rather than having right. to think, okay, I need to set up and show people how to do this. Then it's like, now it's a thing where it's like, this right. just kind of happens. <laughs> right. <laughs> it just naturally. And if there was a noise that came through on the microphone, I just dropped a notebook, but we're good. We're good. Yeah. Um, but that is interesting because that is the one thing I had pulled out and actually wrote it in another color. So color coded mm -hmm. and this one was bright green with an exclamation point. And the one thing I had noted was the instructional value exclamation yes. point. Um, yeah. Because that is something I'm excited about um, being a teacher and thinking, you know, with a lot of people who are beginning or even people who are more advanced and want new ideas, like you don't have to learn everything without, you know, you can totally be inspired by seeing other people do this. Yeah. You know that you basically have my dream job, right? Yeah. You have mentioned that <laughs> <laughs> you want to be a professor and you know, you have my dream job, right? <laughs> the only thing is that we get to do this one together now. Yes. Least, and that's, that's cool. So cool. Oh, yeah. oh my God, just talking at the same time. So cool. Yeah. But it's like, the, I think the only thing that would be different is, of course, if I did have your job, I would also be teaching a lot more literature classes because you could do that. Oh, oh yes. my God. Of course, then I'd have to grade the essays. Oh. Yeah. So do you want to rethink that? <laughs> I, I can't believe how burned out I got on that after two years. Uh, but, but of course, you know, let me, let me just say a lot of the essays that I was writing were not on literature. They were just okay. generic. We're trying to teach you how to do research for some reason, while at the same time, also trying to teach you how to write well. Because we think right. for some reason, those two things go together when they don't. <sighs> I, have, um, I have spent many years grading those same <laughs> essays, and it does burn you out. It's hard. It's yeah. hard. Oh, man. Well, that was actually my last topic card. So do you have any closing thoughts? Or uh, I don't know. Uh, honestly, we covered a lot. We've been talking for like three hours now. Yes, we have. <laughs> <laughs> All together. It's been, yeah. it's been an evening. But um, I mean, there are a million things I'm sure that could be said, but I do know that Meridian is going to arrive very shortly. So I need to be mindful of that. But um, I mean, I don't know, like, I, I'm just, I'm really, I'm just really delighted that there were so many people that were following along today. That was yes. really cool. So I, I hope that they, they all come back and also that they find value in it. Um, oh, and also when we did our, our shout out, we should actually shout out to the, the people. So it was Matez, uh, and Croyd, uh, R-H-O-I-D is our first patrons. Thank you so much. And also thank you to our new patron, Veronica Hamilton, a friend of mine. Um, and also to Jason Reed. Oh. A new patron just now. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> I really you. liked his contributions on the uh, Oh on my the gosh, chat. yes. Yes. <laughs> and one thing I really liked about the chat was that it wasn't just with us. They had There was a lot of cross chatter um, with people answering questions and that's I don't, cool. That just made me really happy. It's such a good community. Yeah. All right. So, well, right on. Uh, all right. Well, thank you for listening and thank you for being a patron. And we look forward to talking to you again, not only in the live stream videos, but once a month, we will drop new episodes of Langtime Chat. All right. So talk to you later. <laughs>